Good afternoon. Uh, we're happy to welcome you to our webinar on uh, the DPAD, which is the Dis Digital Physical Activity and Diet Collaborative. So this is a uh, joint uh, project of MD Anderson Cancer Center and UT Health. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But for right now, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce myself. I'm Deanna Helsher from UT Health School of Public Health, and I'm director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And just a few housekeeping hints before we start. So first of all, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, if you have any questions as we go along, just feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, secondly, uh, this recording, this webinar is being recorded and the recording is going to be on the uh, Dell Center website at msdcenter.org. So we'll repeat that at the end. Um, finally, all participants on this webinar will receive a follow-up email with more information about the DPAD collaborative. So we'll highlight that again at the end of the webinar. And so as we begin today, I'd like to introduce our panelists and members of DPAD. So uh, first I'd like to uh, recognize Karen Bazin Inquest. Uh, who is one of the leads on the MD Anderson side. And then uh, Tuan Lee, who is our contact for DPAD. So you'll see Tuan's email show up later during the presentation. Um, the second speaker for today is Leah Wiggum. And Leah is with UT Health School of Public Health, and she's at our El Paso campus. So this truly is a cross Texas uh, webinar since we have El Paso, Austin, and Houston all represented. And then the final speaker today is Sahidi Manini, who is at the UT Health School of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, so we're very pleased to have these three speakers describe some of the projects that are associated with DPAD, and then talk about the possibilities of what this collaborative can do. So uh, I'd like to start first uh, with the next slide and tell you a little bit about our UT Health MD Anderson Cancer Center Population Health Initiative. So what this initiative is, is funding to accelerate public health, population health collaborations between our two institutions. And so the overall goal, as you see there, is to achieve a measurable and meaningful reduction in the burden of chronic disease, especially among the underserved in whom the impact of these illnesses and adverse outcomes are the most consequential. So this initiative began last year, and so we were invited to apply for different projects. And so there were three types of funding opportunities that were presented, a uh, quick start uh, projects, and then an impact fund. So DPAD, our project here is part of the impact fund. Next slide, please. So the rationale behind DPAC, uh, part of the impact fund, the, the purpose of that is to increase, to do capacity building. And so uh, one of the things in uh, building this up is looking for the rationale on why we're doing it. So what we do know that the prevalence of overweight and obesity in Texas is a significant public health issue. And so we really need to look at scalable solutions to help Texans manage their weight and specifically focusing on modifiable determinants which in our case right now is eating behaviors and physical activity. And so we know that digital health tools can provide solutions, but research is needed to develop effective content, to look at usability interfaces, to look at context specific tailoring, and then to expand the use of these tools among low resource populations, um, because we know that Texas has a lot of low resource populations. 
So finally, uh, part of the rationale behind this is really developing these digital tools, testing them needs a team science approach. And so this really lends itself well to this initiative for population health. Next slide, please. So the aims of our DPAD, uh, we have three main aims. So first is to conduct a needs assessment to identify MD Anderson and UT Health researchers with relevant interest, and then identify their needs for training, collaborators, and infrastructure. So part of this today, we'll talk about ways in which we can do this. So we hope that a lot of you that are on the webinar are interested in this area and would like to connect. The second aim is to provide training and network opportunities to support and connect digital health and obesity researchers. So we're kind of casting a broad net in this respect. The third aim is to create core services based on investigator needs identified in AIM-1. And so these include an online resource clearinghouse and collaboration platform, uh, consulta uh, consultation and negation services, and then technical services such as usability testing, measurement, accessing and pre-processing of digital device data. So next slide, please. So the anticipated outcomes of the DPAD collaborative is one is to increase institutional ability to successfully compete for NIH and other funding. And we also are including in there partnerships with industry, so STTR, SBIR grants. Secondly, we'd like to enhance researchers' competitiveness for funding priorities, specifically those identified in the 2020-2030 strategic plan for NIH nutrition research. Uh, there's also a strategic plan for obesity research as well. So these areas focus on precision nutrition, implementation science, and individualized approaches to weight management. Thirdly, we think that the resulting research would lead to highly scalable and cost-effective interventions that could decrease obesity and subsequent diseases and disability in Texas. And so this would lead to a significant public health impact. Finally, we are trying to leverage what we're doing here with a newly formed Texas Network of Obesity Research uh, that is involving different institutions across the state. So not only will we involve the two institutions mentioned here, but extend it out to other uh, research institutions across Texas. Next slide. So again, just to present the leadership of DPAC uh, from on the MD Anderson Cancer Center side, it's Dr. Karen Bazin Inquest is the lead. Uh, Dr. Susan Peterson is also involved with this, and then Tuan Lee is our contact, so she's doing a lot of the coordination. On the UT Health side, Dr. Leah Wiggum is co-lead with Dr. Sahidi Mainini, and I'm also involved in the uh, collaborative. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our scope of work, and we'll talk more about this later, but there will be a needs assessment survey going out. So it will be in the link, it, more information about the survey will be in the link following this webinar, but we will be distributing the survey by the end of this month. So please fill it out and we hope you'll forward it to other investigators who have the similar interest. Secondly, we will have a webinar series, and so part of the webinar series is what we're doing today, but we intend to have other webinar series during the two years that we're funded. Part of the webinar series will, will include digital health training, and so we are looking to see what might be of interest. So some topics that we're thinking about are social listening, um, data visualization or network visualization, M health intervention development, and then user centered design. Uh, so as we go as we go forward, we'll have some webinars on that 
as well as some presentations in our symposia. So we have proposed two symposia, one that will be virtual this year, and then one hopefully that will be in person uh, in the next year, 2023. And finally, we're providing some core services. So one of those is a website. The link is there. The other one will be a clearinghouse of resources. So we would like to invite you to uh, provide resources that we can link there. Uh, there will be some opportunities for fee-for-service work. And then there will be a limited no, uh, amount of supplemental funding for researchers uh, for pilot projects or to supplement something that's already in place. And so with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Karen Bazin Inquest uh, to describe her work. All right, thank you so much, uh, Deanna, and thank you everybody for attending today. It's great to see so many of you. I want to talk a little bit about our Digital Health and Fitness Collaborative, which was a, a, is a strategic initiative at MD Anderson that's kind of a precursor to DPAD. Next slide, please. So the Digital Health and Fitness Collaborative was funded by the Duncan Family Institute from starting in 2018. And what we aim to do is to develop some innovative technology-based weight loss intervention strategies and products and test them in, um, in the context of an evidence-based weight management program in MD Anderson cohort. So we run a lot of uh, pilot studies. Um, and use that to really create a data resource for investigators that looks at the effectiveness and, and usability of those interventions and uh, predictors of participation and so forth. Next slide, please. This is kind of the structure of the Digital Health and Fitness Collaborative. <clears throat> On the left, we have the collaborative, which is um, really uh, doing some of the activities that I just described. Um, we also do things like code our intervention products using the Mickey Behavior Change Taxonomy. Um, we've been doing some uh, few systematic reviews and pilot testing. Um, we're supported in this by the AIM Shared Resource, which is a shared resource at MD Anderson that, among other things, does database development and also um, e-health tool development. Um, and then we're doing these pilot tests in the context of four cohorts at MD Anderson, the Mexican American cohort, Project Church, which is a um, group of uh, African American churches, the mammography cohort, um, as described, it is a um, group of women who are undergoing mammography, and then the high risk, the others here is the, um, a cohort of women who are at increased risk for breast cancer. And what we want to do through these pilot tests is produce some preliminary data um, that can that investigators can use in applications as well as um, some effective products that can be incorporated in interventions they test. Next slide, please. The faculty who have been involved over the years um, are many. We um, it includes myself and Susan Peterson in behavioral science, as well as Yue Liao and Susan Chembray, who are now at other institutions but still collaborate with us. Susan Gilchrist, Abena Brewster, and Sam Hanash from Clinical Cancer Prevention, Larkin Strong and Sh Shahrazad Mama, and Lorna McNeil from Health Disparities Research, and Carrie Daniel McDougall from Epidemiology. Next slide, please. So these are some of the products and projects that we've been working on. I'm just going to describe each one briefly to give you a, a flavor for what we've been doing. Next slide. Kind of the, the core project that we've been working on is doing a pilot test of a digital weight loss intervention in the uh, four cohorts that I mentioned. So we wanted to see whether the populations represented by this cohort would be receptive to a very low touch digital um, intervention and um, whether it would be feasible to deliver it. So we, um, again, are working with the four cohorts that I mentioned. The Mexican-American cohort actually did the pilot in dyads, um, family or friendship dyads. Project Church limited their uh, pilot test to men um, from the predominantly African-American churches. And then the uh, mammography cohort and high-risk breast cohort were uh, people from uh, any people who were participating in those cohorts. Primarily, we wanted to look at the intervention feasibility, but also secondarily look at um, some efficacy 
And we do, um, we were able to complete the pilots in three of the four cohorts with very good follow-up rates. Um, we still are have the pilot ongoing in the Mexican American cohort. We have a few people finishing up there. People were quite satisfied with the intervention. Um, and also this is, these are preliminary data on the weight loss, but we early on anyways, we were seeing a, a weight loss of about nine pounds. Next slide. We also have been developing some brief videos that can be embedded into interventions. So we have, these are one to two minute videos related to weight management topics and skills. Um, we've um, worked on and, and produced so far the portion control and stress management videos, but we now um, have in development meal planning and physical activity. These are being done in collaboration with MD Anderson's Community Alliance Department. They do the production. We help them come up with the content. And um, the idea is that these can be provided to people who are in the digital interventions, but we're also um, using it in social media, particularly MD Anderson social media. Next slide, please. My Snack Tracker is an app that we have been developing as an alternative to traditional dietary self-monitoring. We know that um, in weight loss programs, people who are very adherent to dietary self-monitoring have better outcomes. So if people are writing down everything that they eat and drink, um, that tends to predict success. But, but also we know that people have a very difficult time adhering to that over long periods of time. So my snack tracker is an attempt to um, simplify dietary self-monitoring um, in hopes that it will be effective, but also um, that more people will be able to adhere for a longer period of time. So using this app, the user records only their energy dense nutrient poor foods, and they receive feedback on um, sugar grams and empty calorie limits. So you know, the, the goal is for them to kind of stay below a certain limit for the day. Um, we've been assisted in the app development, um, actually the group doing the app development for us, I should say, is the AIM shared resource that I mentioned before, led by Susan Peterson. Next slide, please. So we've been doing some usability testing with um, my snack tracker, and we hope in the next phase to incorporate that into a pilot with uh, a weight, digital weight loss pilot with some of the cohorts. Um, we've interviewed people both who um, have participated in weight loss programs previously and people who have not. And um, they provided us with feedback on the clarity of information, the appearance, the usefulness of the app. Um, we found that many of the comments indicated that they really, um, we needed to provide a better orientation to the purpose of this abbreviated self-monitoring because some people were still looking for, you know, really detailed monitoring. Um, and also uh, they gave us some ideas for how to revise the app to um, provide for better navigation. So we are, working on that now and hope to be able to pilot test a revised version soon. Next slide, please. Um, our, several of our investigators were interested in incorporating cooking videos into weight loss interventions for healthy, um, for health, teaching healthy cooking, but we realized that there were a lot of different formats for cooking videos and we didn't really know which types would be most effective or that people would be most receptive to. So we have done a pilot using existing videos from YouTube um, and, and looked at people's responses to three different video types. So we had um, what we call the speedy videos, um, brief like one minute videos where the cooking is sped up, there's no talking, the, just the ingredients are all pre-prepped and being added to the bowl or the pan. Um, and uh, and you, know, you see the final product in the end. Uh, brief videos were uh, two to three minutes, uh, hosted video, there was some real-time cooking, um, some discussion of health benefits, but ingredients were all entirely pre-prepped. And then a longer format, four to eight minutes, um, that's hosted, um, the, the, there's the prep and cooking is done in real time to a limited extent. And the host is also discussing um, prep techniques. So next slide, please. We really, um, I think, the results were very interesting, although we need to look at a couple of different um, videos in the future because um, some of this may be video specific, but the lighter colors here indicate the um, a, a better letter grade given to the video. So you can see the brief and long 
formats were um, more favorably graded than the speedy. Um, there also were really different kinds of comments in terms of likes and dislikes, whereas um, in the speedy, they, they kind of liked the look of it, but felt like it just went too fast. They couldn't figure out how they would cook based on that video. Um, in the brief, they really liked hearing um, a little bit more about the health benefits. They liked the presenters, they liked the visuals. Um, some dislikes uh, with regard to the food itself, and um, some did think this was a little too boring. Um, and then the longer video, uh, they there were a lot of likes about the information given, but I think in the long video, we really got into issues with people either liking the host or not liking the host. So I think in, in a longer format video, it's really important to pay attention to the to who the host is, how they act, and how that's going to be received by the 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 population that you want to use the video with. Next slide, please. We have a few new projects that we're initiating this year. Um, one is a telehealth best practices. So we wanted to find out um, how people responded to participating in a Zoom-based, a Zoom-delivered intervention. So we have a, a, as many people do, we we've had several studies ongoing that either converted from in-person to Zoom or have been entirely on Zoom. So we've been interviewing our participants about the advantages and barriers of using that technology. And um, these include um, uh, Spanish speaking, um, Latina populations, Latino populations, um, African-Americans, rural populations, and we want to use the information to develop sort of a best practices guide. Um, we also received some donor funding to um, test a develop and test a text messaging intervention to help people reduce sedentary behavior and we're going to be testing um, the difference in effectiveness between activity responsive messages uh, versus generic versus just the standard Fitbit messages that people get and we'll be recruiting participants through our community alliances programs. Next slide. So that's sort of an overview of um, what we've been doing in uh, the Digital Health and Fitness Collaborative. And we feel like some of these um, resources can nicely channel into the DPAD as we develop that further. So we look forward to um, working with our collaborators at UT Health and working with all of you. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Leah Wiggum. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Wiggum. I'm the director of the UT Health Center for Community Health Impact at the El Paso campus. And today I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the digital tools that we either have developed or have put into practice in community settings for both interventions and data collection. Next slide, please. First, a little bit about our center. We use community driven solutions. So really working with our community partners to identify where to focus our efforts. But those solutions are informed by science uh, to address healthy eating, active living, and obesity throughout the region. We use the collective impact model and socio-ecological model. And we have three functional cores, including translational research core, implementation and evaluation core, and a policy and advocacy core. Next slide, please. Our partnerships are essential, as I indicated in the previous slide. And right now, our partnership areas include food systems, metabolic health and primary care, workplace wellness, school wellness, and built environment. Next slide, please. I'm going to tell you a little bit first about some scalable interventions that we've developed from the digital uh, and technology side. First, talking about a nutrition therapy for weight loss approach and then moving on to a primary care obesity management strategy. Next slide, please. With input from primary care providers from our region, they told us they really needed more support to do the um, detailed nutrition prescription for patients that was part of a training program that we built for providers in our region. They said they just didn't have time to do the detailed nutrition um, design for patients nor did they have the nutrition expertise. So we built a tool called Small Changes, which is a web-based app. Next slide, please. 
The app allows patients to go in and enter their own measurements uh, through their phone, a tablet, a computer, anything with internet connection. And those measurements are then used to help the patient design their own um, weight loss plan, their own change plan, as we call it. Next slide, please. This, the technology here is built on the evidence that the best weight loss plan is one that people will follow. So uh, we encourage participants to think about what they normally eat and then as they go through and make selections from the menu options, that they pick options that are as close to what they currently eat. And we use um, both from the clinical practice expertise and evidence from the field, we use a strategy that um, one of our team members, Dr. Nikhil Durander, has deployed with his patients in his one-on-one -on -one care. And that strategy is to design a customized program that has structure to it, but is not so limited that it can't be flexible within their day-to-day -day life, fit their lifestyle, fit their cultural needs, um, and be something that they can follow relatively easily. So each person picks their own meal plan. Next slide, please. They get four choices from um, more than a dozen options at each meal time. And so a, a participant, for example, who typically eats the items on the left as part of their normal breakfast routine would be encouraged to make selections like those shown on the right that are from the program. The meal plan options have been customized um, based on in-depth interviews we've done here in this region. And so you're going to see as I show you some of these examples that there's some very Hispanic specific food choices that fit the lifestyle and customs of the majority of the population here in our region. Next slide, please. Once they set up their meal plan, they can then access the Flexipi for each meal option, which provides either a recipe or instructions because there are, for example, simple food items and snacks as well as restaurant options. So in those cases, rather than getting a recipe, they get instructions on what to order. And the, we call it a flexibi, flexipi because people can actually scale up the amount of the recipe in order to make it for their whole family. So if, if a patient is following this diet plan, they can choose, for example, what we heard from a lot of patients is that an evening meal is something that they typically eat with their family. So they can pick recipes, use the recipe multiplier to scale that recipe up so the whole family can consume the same meal item. Next slide, please. So they pick four options for each meal time, breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner. And then as they follow the plan, each day they can pick one item from each of those meal times um, to consume for that day. You can see some of the options we have here in the meal plan. Next slide, please. They're also encouraged to track their weight and other measurements within the app, and the app will actually graph their progress for them. Um, they're encouraged to enter their weight as often as they want, but at least weekly. Uh, next slide, please. And every two weeks, they're required to enter their weight so that they can refresh their meal plan. This refreshing the meal plan gives, gives people an important option. We find some patients find a meal plan that they really like and they follow it throughout the program. Others want to change it up every two weeks because they like a lot of variety. But that's one function that participants have told us they really appreciate is that ability to control what's in their meal plan. Next slide, please. So the idea behind the name small changes is that by making small changes to their diet, we're not asking them to eat completely new or unfamiliar foods by making these small changes to their diet and following that plan, they can get big results. Next slide, please. So another scalable intervention that we developed is, is based on um, our course that we designed for primary care providers. And with feedback from those providers, they asked that the course content be more readily available, preferably in an EHR integrated format so they could easily access the information from the course 
during their day-to-day -day practice when working with patients with obesity. Next slide, please. So we built the Primary Care Obesity Management Program, which is a clinical decision support system with EHR integration. Some of the features that we built into the program include dialog boxes. This example dialog box here shows providers how they can initiate the conversation about weight with their patient. This is based both on the clinical expertise of our team, but also on research in this area, looking into what kinds of language patients like and do not like to hear from their healthcare providers. This is a really important first step, dialogue boxes like this, because one significant barrier to obesity treatment is that healthcare providers don't feel comfortable broaching the subject with their patients, or patients get upset with the way in which the topic is broached. Next slide, please. Another feature is information boxes indicated by the I symbol. And this helps providers remember why certain questions throughout the program are asked or what the relevance is. So if they don't remember from the training course or if they never took the training course, this gives them a little bit of information. But once they get familiar with the program and familiar with the purpose behind all the steps in the program, they can skip right through these information boxes and not be slowed down by them. Next slide, please. Another feature we implemented was pull down menus that provide more details about the physical exam adaptations. These are adaptations for standard physical exam um, procedures. So rather than training providers how to do a physical exam, which of course they've all received already, this simply highlights what's different in doing the different aspects of the physical exam for a person with obesity. Next slide, please. And another feature we have our pull down menus for diagnostic reference. So this diagnostic information specific to obesity is available for quick access for the provider. Next slide, please. And the program walks the provider through these various components, um, lifestyle review, weight history and family history, and then the full history and physical exam, medication review, pharmacotherapy guidance, and diet therapy. And this program connects the provider to the small changes program that I went over earlier. So they can enroll their patients into the small changes program through the clinical decision support system simply by entering the patient's email address. Then the patient gets notification that they have access to the program and they can go in and set up their own diet plan. This allows providers to spend minimal time going through the process with their patients, which is one of the biggest challenges we find in working with primary care providers is the short amount of time they have to spend with their patients. Next slide, please. So next I'm gonna talk about some tools that we use in community settings for data collection. I'll spend a little bit of time on the first tool. The second tool I won't have time to go into in depth, but I'll provide you some resource information. Next slide, please. One of the most common community-based intervention strategies related to both nutrition and oftentimes linked with obesity is to increase fruit and vegetable intake. However, we have uh, oftentimes not great ways to assess if the intervention is driving the kind of change in fruit and vegetable intake that we want to see. So to help with informing that process of how well our programming is working and, and how well resources can be diverted to programs, that drive true change, uh, we're able to use a biomarker for total fruit and vegetable intake rather than relying on self-reported intake, which is much less accurate. So the biomarker is a group of compounds called carotenoids. They're found primarily in fruits and vegetables. Our body cannot synthesize them, so we only get them from our diet. They have a characteristic chemical structure, as you can see on the slide here, with this standard conjugated dyeing backbone that helps with the physics behind the detection method. Um, carotenoids are important for overall health, but they also serve as our best biomarker for total fruit and vegetable intake. Historically, we've had to use serum analysis by mass spectroscopy to analyze changes in carotenoid levels in humans, but now we have this new tool that I'm gonna tell you about. Next slide, please. 
This device is called reflectance spectroscopy. It's also referred to as the veggie meter, and it's a non-invasive tool that allows us to assess changes in carotenoid levels in the skin. It's self-calibrating, and it only takes about two minutes to get the measurements. So it's much quicker and easier than drawing blood, especially for community settings. There's no samples to process. There's no storage issues. Um, carotenoid analysis of blood requires protecting the samples from light because the carotenoids can get easily oxidized by UV light. So this method is much easier to use. And you can see if you wanna refer to the validation study that I list at the bottom um, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, I'm the senior author on that paper, um, we did the, the critical um, validation study showing that skin carotenoid level measurements work as well or better than serum carotenoid levels, and we did it in the context of a controlled feeding study, so we knew how many servings of fruits and vegetables people were consuming. So this is a validated method. It works very well. Next slide, please. And if anyone is interested in putting this method into practice in community settings, we're always happy to partner with people on that. We have several of these devices at our center, um, and we can also provide the expertise just to help you get started if, you're, if you have your own device and want to collect data. There are many nuances to data collection that we've learned about over the years. Um, I've listed some of them here, but it's really important to take these into consideration when doing the data collection, or you can end up with data that are not very high quality. Next slide, please. Next, I'm just going to briefly mention an, another method that's in development. Um, it's not ready for full scaled up use in community settings, but just in case there's anyone in the audience who's interested in this area. Next slide, please. We've asked the question of whether or not we can use breath carbon stable isotopes to track energy balance in free living individuals. And I've um, listed our proof of concept study published here in the International Journal of Obesity. We don't have time to go into the details of this methodology today, um, but it's an exciting area with a lot of potential applications. And so I just wanted to make note of that in case there's individuals out there doing breath stable isotope work or interest in tracking energy balance or using that ability to change behavior in how well people follow restricted calorie diets you're certainly welcome to reach out to us to talk further about collaborations. Next slide, please. And here's my contact information. Feel free to let me know if you'd like to follow up on any of these discussions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sahidi, who's going to talk next. Tahiti, I think you're still muted. Uh, thanks, Leah. So, uh, hi everyone. This is Tahiti. Uh, I'm an associate professor at uh, the University of Texas School of Biomedical Informatics at Houston. Uh, uh, today, we are going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk present to you a digital health development framework that I think will be helpful to the advancement of this collaborative that we have here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before I go on to that framework, I just want to uh, sort of give uh, an introduction to the center I come from. I am part of the Center for Digital Health and Analytics, a service core at the School of Biomedical Informatics, um, in which we sort of specialize in digital health uh, and analytics, EHR integration, human factors, uh, research. Uh, as you can see, we sort of uh, drive clinical integration as well as uh, technology integration from the context of patients as well as providers. And a majority of this work is being conducted at the center and is part of that purple uh, column that you see there on the slide. Um, so moving on, uh, to give you a 
brief description of the faculty that are involved in the center. I myself, I, I lead the digital health and social analytics framework development, um, essentially social media, the way in which we could integrate variables into um, health promotion and behavior science projects. Um, and Dr. Amy Franklin, who's an expert in human factors, comes with a cognitive psychology background and a linguistic background. Uh, and Dr. Rogat, a clinician by training, uh, but has loads of knowledge on clinical integration, specifically fire standards, uh, linking our applications to EHR endpoints. And uh, Dr. Meera Subhash, who's a, again a practicing clinician uh, at uh, a physician at UTP and uh, also has her strengths in EHR implementation. So we sort of are leading these efforts at SBMI um, and providing um, service-oriented uh, um, portfolio to patrons within and outside UT. All right, next slide. So now, as part of this DPAT core, I want to introduce you to this framework that uh, that we have come up with. Um, it's called DG Lego Framework, as the name suggests. It's a Lego framework, meaning it's modular. It will help you build on scale and have a phased and take a phased approach to integrating digital health um, interventions into your research. Let me walk you through what the framework is about. Our preliminary goal or our primary goal here is the starting point, which is a clinical or a behavioral use case. And then our uh, ultimate goal is to sort of develop a digital health solution, whether it's a web platform, a mobile app, or a tablet-based uh, intervention. And within that intervention, instead of having a singular application, we foresee uh, or we sort of anticipate a multiple module, uh, a multi-component modular structure, uh, for, such as, um, uh, say, a social forum or a chatbot or integrative electronic health data or a simple socio-demographic survey that sits on the platform. And removing one will not destabilize the application. Um, so we can, uh, so in a community engaged research or in a community based research format, you could sort of take a phased approach to the development of um, these, each of these technical components uh, in a modular fashion. So you could start up with surveys and then integrate EHRs, then stack on variable devices or in whichever order you'd like. Essentially the framework emerge, emerges um, and can be customized to each project. Um, we start off with a mixed methods needs analysis, essentially identifying the stakeholder population, what are we actually trying to change here or intervene here. And then we link it up with a patient engagement framework to ensure sustainable engagement, especially with digital platforms. That's a huge deal because we don't design for apps that get opened once. Our ultimate goal is to have our end users come back to our app and open it a second time. So how do we engage our, uh, our users to be engaged with the intervention that we develop for a longer period of time? And on top of that, if we do have any behavior change uh, components, how do we integrate theories and principles from human behaviors? And then how do we make this technology really robust, uh, meaning how do we make it stand up to the test of time, say with security patches, uh, evolving standards or emerging technologies. For example, we are now looking to extend this framework to include um, um, include uh, emerging uh, environments like virtual platforms. So without changing existing solutions, how do we extend the stack to ensure the scalability of both the platform itself and the robustness of the technologies to the changing um, domains. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so 
the first step in developing a DigiLego powered digital solution is to sort of understand the domain. Uh, what is it that we are interested in? Nutrition? Um, is it physical activity? Or, for example, we are interested in one of the projects I'm working on, we are interested in dietary supplements and the misinformation surrounding dietary supplements and how to help create an awareness among our minority groups when using these supplements. So depending on the project uh, that we are working with, we will need to harvest data. And social media could be a highly uh, information rich data source and we have established techniques to facilitate harvesting of that data. How do we use social media data as a secondary data source to supplement these digital health initiatives in public health research? Uh, and essentially, we from that from that social media data source, we try to understand: could we predict the uh, engagement variables? What is it that they are talking about? How are they expressing their needs? Who are they discussing their needs with? And how could we develop an intervention that responds to these uh, needs of uh, different populations that express them in this uh, emerging social environment? <clears throat> and how such information spreads? How do we address network silos? Uh, all of these questions could be answered using social media as a research resource. Moving on to the next slide. And what fits in in that social listening, which uh, in that social media data harvesting, which we can also call social listening, is a variety of theories depending on what our end goal of that analysis is. For example, if we want to understand how users express their needs in order to properly design our health communications, we use speech act theory in which uh, people use a variety of semantic and syntactic variables to describe themselves. And then behavior change theories that range from social cognitive theory to Mickey's taxonomy, which uh, Dr. Karen Bessin-Enquist has already mentioned. Uh, next. Um, but to really scale up uh, our theoretical application to social media uh, level data, meaning we are talking about millions of data points uh, in a matter of days. So in order to scale up this theoretical application to social media scale, we'll need to leverage some computational models. And right now, transformer models, uh, active learning um, frameworks uh, make are doing very well with good accuracy. Um, so by combining this automated machine learning techniques with theory enriched uh, encoding of labeled or theory enriched encoding of uh, social interactions, we could really extract actionable insights from social media data. And moving on, if we impose on top of that, if we impose uh, network dynamics or social network analysis, we do have uh, really interpretable analysis such as could we identify opinion leaders? What makes high engagement power users in social media? If we replicate those same usage scenarios in our digital interventions, could we enhance engagement in interventional research? So we could sort of identify the persona of users, uh, the content areas, the content interests of users, and how they actually come together to increase digital engagement. And uh, we could extract these patterns as observed in social media and could try and replicate them in digital tools. And that is one of our first steps in DigiLego framework. Um, and we oftentimes supplement it with uh, um, in-depth interviews and focus group with target stakeholder groups to ensure generalizability of the findings. Next slide. Um, and we have applied this framework in the context of cancer survivorship. Uh, we chose this because we really wanted to see if DigiLego is agile, adaptive, and integrative of the diverse needs of this particular user group. Uh, next slide. 
uh, essentially we have started uh, with social media analysis. Uh, we tried to identify the topics they discuss about um, and placing a uh, high focus on the misinformation prevalence in these platforms because those will that misinformation topics will provide us insights into the target areas for intervention development. Next slide. Um, and once we finished our uh, social media analysis, we then conducted in-depth engagement uh, uh, identification or optimization by linking, by trying to find uh, which engagement elements do we need to implement in our solution. And for that, there are a variety of engagement frameworks. And in this project, we have used the HIMSS patient engagement framework, which is essentially a cumulative framework that as you can see, lists a variety of digital tools ranging from EHRs to trackers to online communities and integrative EHR or uh, EHR integrative patient records. So we then tried to optimize engagement by selecting a few elements from this framework. And moving on to step three, we then decide, designed individual modules, which we called survive, which we called survivor digi Legos, because we are working in the cancer survivor group. And for each block or each module that we design, we defined the operational aim for each of the features and integrated them with behavior change strategies, defined user interactions, and interactions with the other modules that we have and um, ensure that they are clinically integrative in future. So uh, by using fire standards that I um, have listed here on the side. So essentially we start from bottom and build our way into these modular blocks, which we can mix and match, reuse as we need for different applications uh, and for different um, stakeholders that we are interested in providing these solutions for. Next step. And this is what we have come up with. Um, so these are the range of topics that we have identified uh, from our social media analysis. Um, and these are the, the icons of the ones that we have developed as individual survivor digi Lego blocks, ranging from uh, behavioral trackers to care scheduling, uh, educational modules with uh, uh, lifestyle tips, a social community and such. Next slide. And we have implemented it in a fire, uh, in a standards compliant format, wherein we have four major Digi Lego blocks, uh, a Digi Me to record personal information, a Digi EHR to record clinical information, Digi Connect for wearables and for other devices that our young survivors might want to connect, and social group to ask questions, to interact with peers, to journal because journaling seems to be a very, in, very uh, high impact intervention feature as we have identified in our social media analysis. Next slide. And we have tested the preliminary prototypes and we have gotten good technology acceptance. Uh, and interestingly, 75% of our participants indicated positive sentiment uh, because we have used social media that since they, some of them actually mentioned that we use social media to learn about a lot of these uh, uh, survivor um, behaviors and for you to use them means you know us a little more than from the interviews. Um, and we have gotten good uh, feedback. Uh, we did receive uh, some preliminary comments on the ways in which we can organize content across the flow four blocks. For example, they wanted us to shift journaling from DigiSocial to DigiMe because it's more personal. So we, we are making those changes and implementing them for a full scale evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. And in addition to cancer survivorship, we did uh, develop Digi Lego based interventions in a variety of other areas, including stress management, 
uh, and uh, especially among pregnant women, minority pregnant women, um, how do they treat depression during pregnancy and to sort of help them go through a cognitive behavioral therapy using a mobile app that's powered by these DigiLego modules. Uh, another application area is, um, next slide. Uh, again, high-risk pregnancy management, especially gestational diabetes. How do we create tools that will enhance their engagement? For example, we are looking to integrate a chatbot to ensure personalized education. Um, what this really does is, if a woman inputs a blood glucose level when they are pregnant, either a fasting glucose level, then based on the input they put in, the data they put in, the chatbot responds saying, hey, your blood sugar is XYZ, would you like to learn something about managing it? So it's really personalized data responsive in a way. Next slide. So as part of DPAD, I, I think we could provide services that are responsive to social listening and can help you develop mobile applications that have a range of these features that I have uh, demonstrated to you in this talk. Um, uh, next slide. And acknowledgements to all our clinical and public health collaborators and our team members and programmers at our center. Uh, and I really thank for this opportunity. And I now turn this to Diana so uh, she can summarize the discussion for us. Yes. Thanks so much, Sahidi. So just a few kind of last notes and we have time for maybe one question. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions there, but if you are interested in DPAD, uh, please complete our needs assessment. So it will be going out this month. So please look for an email. We'll make several announcements about it. And everyone who's on the, the webinar, who signed up for the webinar, will get a follow-up email about the survey. Um, attend our webinars, so we'll be announcing those as well. Visit the website. It's not very filled out right now, but, and also if you have something that you'd like to link to it, let us know and we can add that. Um, and then contact us. So if you'd like to contact uh, Tuan Lee, uh, her email is there and we'll keep it up while we're answering questions. So if the rest of the panelists could jump on real quickly, and we have just a couple of questions. So uh, Dr. Bazin Inquest, uh, can you speak a little bit more about the benefits of a dyad delivered intervention? Sure, so we know that behaviors like um, eating and, and uh, physical activity and so forth don't take place in a vacuum, um, that others influence our behaviors as well. And, and I think, you know, eating is a great example. Much of our eating takes place um, with family, with friends, and they influence our choices. And so um, intervening with a dyad um, provides the potential for the two members of the dyad to provide support for each other, but also to have an impact on that environment, that eating behavior environment and that physical activity environment. This is a specific interest of Dr. Larkin Strong, who's one of the members of the Digital Health and Fitness Collaborative, and she has um, several grants where she's evaluating dyadic strategies um, to physical activity and dietary change. But thanks for the question. And then one real quick last question. Um, and this is kind of an issue that we'll be looking at too. Uh, can panelists speak about the language of diet obesity and how they impact participants that sign up for studies? So that's really something that's relevant across all of the uh, presentations today. I know this, the studies in the field have shown that most people prefer not to use the word obesity. So if I, I don't have data specifically about study participation and language used, but I know in the clinical context, most patients will indicate they prefer, prefer their providers and other clinical staff to use other words like um, overweight or excess weight, for example. 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good point as we uh, embark on this and engage in research to help people um, live healthy lifestyles to manage their weight. Um, that we're we're sensitive to the issues of um, obesity stigma or stigma against people who are um, overweight. Um, and uh, I think if you're looking for guidance on this, the Obesity Action Coalition um, has media guides. Um, for and and discussion of uh, you know guidance for um, healthcare providers and the kind of language they should use. They have um, media guides for images because um, oftentimes we see uh, materials created uh, with images of people who are uh, large or overweight that are very unflattering and not uh, not likely to make people receptive to want to engage with those materials and and so. Um, th this is a really critically important issue, and I, I urge you to you know, take a look at um, the, the resources at, on the Obesity Action Coalition. Interestingly, MD Anderson uh, Community Alliances Group has just started changing all their um, educational materials to, to take out the word obesity unless they need to use that in a specific scientific context. Um, so we're, we're trying to um, improve our communication about this issue as well. So uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time today, but I do want to thank all the panelists and Kate Ferris, who's been running things behind the scenes, and then Tuan Lee, who's kind of coordinating everything here. Uh, I think that the last question is an example of something that we could address during one of our webinars. That would be a great topic, I think, uh, to delve in further. Um, but in the meantime, look for a follow-up uh, email from us. If you want to access the recording, it's at msdcenter.org. It'll be posted probably later today or early tomorrow. Uh, feel free to distribute that. And please look for more information about DPAD. We're very excited about this initiative and thankful to MD Anderson and UT Health for funding this initiative to bring us together. Uh, so we're really looking forward to see what comes out of this collaborative. Uh, so please join us in the activities that we have planned. And then I'd just like to say thank you again for listening. Uh, please share it and uh, have a great day. Uh, try and stay warm. Uh, so take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.